Hello again. In today's presentation, we will discuss the growth of the service sector in core countries and the impact of industrial location theories on the distribution of industries across the globe. So the first question that we will attempt to answer is what is the service economy and where are services concentrated? Now, the service industry, also called the tertiary sector, produces intangible goods, more precisely services, instead of goods. And according to the U.S. Census Bureau, it comprises various services, uh, service industries, including warehousing and transportation services, information services, securities and other investment services, professional services, waste management, healthcare and social assistance, and arts, entertainment, and recreation. In core countries with higher levels of specialization, the service sector is divided into subgroups. The coordinary sector describes the knowledge-based part of the economy, which typically includes knowledge-oriented economic sectors such as information technology, media, research and development, informa information-based services such as information generation and information sharing, as well as knowledge-based services such as consultation, education, financial planning, blogging, and designing. The quinary sector deals with the complex decision-making sector at the local and national level. Now, this sector can include top executives or officials in fields such as government, science, universities, nonprofits, healthcare, culture, and media. Now, over the past three decades, core countries have gone through the process of deindustrialization, where industrial jobs have not just disappeared, but instead they have been outsourced or offshored to the developing world, or in many cases replaced with mechanization and machinery. Now, the process of deindustrialization in core countries has led to the creation of post industrial societies in countries like the US, Canada, Japan, and Western Europe. Post-industrial societies are societies in which an economic transition has occurred from a manufactured-based economy to a service-based economy. However, the classification of core countries as post-industrial should be considered from the perspective of jobs, not industrial output. For example, industrial production output has increased in the United States while employment has declined. According to the St. Louis Federal Reserve, industrial output has increased by 45% since 1982, while industrial employment has declined by 68% during the same period. Now, this graph provides some context to that situation. Many people have argued that jobs are being sent overseas and that it's primarily because of deindustrialization. While this is probably a major cause of job loss, it's not the only cause. Increased productivity due to improved technology has also resulted in less manufacturing jobs. Many of the semi-skilled labor jobs that used to be done by hand are now being done by computer and machines. Improved technology, outsourcing, and offshoring have led to a global shift in production over the past three decades. More than 70% of the jobs in countries like the United States, France, and the UK are in the service sector. The downside is an increase in unemployment for unskilled and semi-skilled workers. The upside is an increase in highly educated workers. Now, many service sector jobs, especially the ones performed in the United States and Western Europe, require advanced degrees and pay much higher wages. This has resulted in an educational divide between the baby boomer generation and millennials. More people than ever are leaving high school and going to college to receive, receive advanced education in a service sector career. Now, the rise of the post-industrial society has been spurred on by a series of events, two of which include free trade agreements and globalization. But one in particular led to a massive increase in service sector jobs across the globe. Information technologies such as the Internet, cell phones, and social media have resulted in a much more connected and globalized society. Today, you can make a video call instantaneously across the globe. Some jobs that required people to work in an office can now be done remotely from home. This has become normalized, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, as more people are working from home and meetings are held virtually over software like Zoom and Google Meets. Improvements in information technologies and transportation methods has resulted in the reduction of distance decay through a process known as space-time convergence. Now, distance decay is represented in this graph. As 
people are closer to each other, they are more likely to interact with one another. As distance increases, they are less likely to interact. The term distance decay is related to Tobler's law, which states, quote, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Now the figure on the right is a representation of time-space compression or space-time convergence. Now this theory argues that as technology improves, people are, or objects are more likely to interact over greater distances. The first and second industrial revolutions are great examples of this phenomenon. Transportation technology such as the train and automobile greatly reduce the time required to travel long distances, thereby increasing the probability that people would interact over those distances. Now other phenomena influenced the rise of post-industrial societies such as the improvements in market accessibility for people in developing countries. Global supply chains spurred really by improved transportation and information technologies and the rise of transnational corporations allowed corporations to move parts of their operation in developing countries with reduced regulations and lower wages. Now, as technology improved, connections between countries around the world and trade agreements made it easier on corporations to move operations overseas. Many companies resorted to outsourcing and offshoring. Outsourcing refers to the removal of part of a firm's operation and hiring an outside firm to do it instead. This is most often associated with big tech firms and the telecom industry. For example, India is the world's second largest telecommunication market. This is the result of a massive migration of telecom jobs to India starting in the 1990s and, growing wor and a growing working age population. India also has a large educated labor force that is still growing. Today, companies such as Microsoft, American Express, and Cisco outsource major parts of their operations to Indian-owned companies. In 2010, for example, Microsoft signed a deal with Infosys Technologies to manage the internal IT services for the software giant. The deal included services such as IT help desks, desk side services, and application support. In 1994, American Express signed a multi-year deal with Infosys and Tata Consulting Services to manage its, ser its customer services. In recent years, Cisco has outsourced its research and development to a litany of research firms in India. Now, offshoring is a type of outsourcing where businesses move their operations to another country but continue to operate within the company. This is common in car manufacturing where parts of the manufacturing process are still produced by the company but completed in countries with lower wages and regulations. For example, the Chevy Silverado is assembled in the United States. Its engines, in particular, are manufactured in Dearborn, Michigan. But its transmission is built in Mexico. Each of these operations are owned and operated by Chevrolet, but located in specific areas to take advantage of access to resources, markets, and labor. So that brings us to the next question. How do location theories explain industrial location? This question is not easily answered, but we'll attempt to discuss three major theories that at least somewhat explain why industrial firms locate where they do. Location theory is a subfield of economic geography that attempts to predict or explain reasons behind the location of certain firms. Early theorists designed their models to help answer the question, why do competitors open their stores next to one another? While these models uh, that we'll discuss don't really answer this question completely, they do provide valuable insight into how firms choose the right location. These firms focus on four main points, variable costs associated with changes in production, profit maximization approaches to reducing variable costs, and the cost of transportation due to friction of distance. Variable costs refer to expenses that change in proportion to production output. Variable costs increase or decrease depending on a company's production volume. They rise as production increases and fall as production decreases. Labor costs in raw materials are examples of variable costs and can change dramatically depending on location. Friction of distance refers to the principle that movement incurs some form of cost based on physical effort, energy, time, and the expenditure of resources. Location theories focus on the trade-off between access to raw materials 
and access to markets based on the cost of transportation. Each model we will discuss includes some consideration of industrial site and situational factors. According to the slide, industry seeks to maximize or capitalize profits by minimizing production costs. Two geographic costs are site and situation. Situational factors deal directly with the location of an industry as it relates to the location of the market and raw materials. Industries choose locations by weighing the cost of transporting raw materials versus the finished product. Bulk reducing industries are industries where the final product weighs less than the raw materials, therefore it costs less to transport. Bulk reducing industries are often located near the raw materials or process materials in order to reduce the friction of distance. Now, shoe manufacturing is an example of a bulk reducing industry. Today, 90% of rubber is made in Asia, with Thailand and Indonesia being the top producers in the region. This has resulted in a large number of Nike shoes being produced in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. Bulk gaining industries are industries where the final product weighs more and costs more to transport than the initial input. Because of the cost of transporting the final product, bulk gaining industries are often located near the consumer market. Now the canning industry is a prime example of a bulk gaining industry. For example, Coca-Cola uses water, sugar, corn syrup, and various other flavorings to create its product each of which is either readily available near the United States or easily transported from overseas. The final product is canned or bottled, therefore it weighs more to transport. For this reason, Coca-Cola is produced in and around Atlanta. Another situational factor is access to break of bulk points. These are locations where multiple forms of transportation converge. Large break of bulk points, such as the shipping yard in New Orleans, connect seagoing ships with the railroad, bulk transport trucks, and the air freight industry. The break, of point, uh, the break of bulk point pictured here is the port of Hamburg, Germany, the leading port in cargo tonnage of the European Union. The large rail, y rail yard transports containers in and out of the port to the rest of the country, while ships transport these containers in and out of the country. Containerization was probably one of the most important inventions in the 20th century because it allowed goods to be moved from one mode of transportation to another more quickly. Notice the cranes in the background. These cranes can quickly lift large containers and place them onto trucks or trains. Now, site factors include land, labor, and capital. Industrial firms focus on the cost of these firms at an individual site to determine the best possible location to place their operations. Labor-intensive industries such as plantation agriculture are often situated in countries with lower wages. Capital-intensive industries such as pharmaceuticals are located in wealthy countries. Land is a major factor in site location as well and has resulted in many firms moving to countries or regions with lower land prices and property taxes. Now, one of the most influential location theories is called the least cost theory, and it was produced by Alfred Weber in 1909 while he was a professor of economics at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. He proposed a theory that firms should choose their location based on the trade-off between transporting raw materials and transporting the finished product. While relying heavily on transportation costs, Weber also discussed the importance of labor costs and agglomeration costs on industrial location. Now, the least cost theory states that industries determine optimum location based on transportation, labor, and agglomeration. One of the primary tenets of Weber's theory is, is the impact of transportation costs on profit margins between bulk gaining and bulk reducing industries. Also important is the impact of break of bulk points in location. He argued that bulk reducing industries would be located closer to the raw materials and bulk gaining industries would be located near the market. However, he claimed that infrastructure can have a profound impact as industries may also locate near ports to reduce transportation costs. Weber also argued that the most important consideration for firms is the cost of transporting finished goods to the market because without the market, there is no industry. Labor costs are also an important part of industrial location. The least cost theory states that if similar labor pool exists in different locations, but one labor pool is significantly smaller than another, 
As long as the savings from changing locations outweigh the cost of transportation, firms will locate near the cheapest labor markets. Finally, Weber argued that trends in agglomeration have had a significant impact on industrial location as well. Agglomeration refers to the clustering of businesses from similar industries that use some of the same raw materials and processed materials. Infrastructure can, have an also, uh, can also have a profound impact on the location of industrial clusters and lead to agglomeration in certain urban centers. For example, one of the biggest agglomeration economies to develop over the past 30 years is the high-tech industry. This crude diagram of high-tech agglomeration represents the impact of infrastructure and firm similarities on the location of these businesses. The location of a rail depot and seaport on the bottom left of the diagram has an impact on the clustering of these firms. Because, of these, fir because these firms use similar raw and processed materials, they cluster near each other and benefit from easy access to these materials coming from the port. Firms that require heavier materials are located closer to the port, while other firms are located further away. Now this slide is an example of the least cost theory. According to Weber's model, a brewery would need to consider the cost of transporting hops and grain, spring water, and bottled beer in its locational decisions. The location of a rail depot and clustering of other breweries would also need to be considered in order to reduce transportation costs. The cost of transporting bottled beer, in this example, uh, is the highest at 27 cents a mile, while hops and grain come in second at 11 cents a mile. The brewery would need to locate as close to Thirsty Town as possible to reduce costs, while their decision is based primarily on the differences between the cost of transporting the finished beer or the raw materials, the brewery might also consider locating near the rail juncture. While this model doesn't explain all the variables that go into locational decisions, it has grown in popularity over the years as an effective way of explaining current trends in industrial location. Now the second model that we'll discuss is known as Hotelling's location model of locational interdependence. In 1929, Harold Hotelling was a professor of mathematics at Stanford University when he first proposed the idea of locational interdependence. He proposed that the location of firms cannot be understood without first looking at the location of other firms from the same industry. For example, uh, you might have wondered why when you are on a, a highway or a road trip that you don't see a gas station for miles. But then all of a sudden, four of them appear at a single intersection. Hotelling's model attempted to explain this relationship. In his model, firms choose locations based on distance away from similar firms along a single roadway. Firms respond to changes in demand and the economic environment and move accordingly. Similar industries move toward one another in a constant struggle to control market area. This competition eventually results in something called Nash Equilibrium, the state where neither firm can improve their position within the market. This theory was built on three main assumptions. One, production costs are uniform. Two, product selection is uniform. And three, demand is uniform. These assumptions make the model difficult to apply to the real world, but Hotelling's theory provides some explanation of locational interdependence of certain businesses. So let's take a, uh, a minute to watch this short clip explaining the Hotelling model. Why are gas stations always built right next to other gas stations? Why is it that I can drive for a mile without finding a coffee shop and then stumble across three on the same corner? Why do grocery stores, auto repair shops, and restaurants always seem to exist in groups instead of being spread evenly throughout a community? While there are several factors that might go into deciding where to place your business, clusters of similar companies can be explained by a very simple story called Hotelling's Model of Spatial Competition. Imagine that you sell ice cream at the beach. Your beach is one mile long and you have no competition. Where would you place your cart in order to sell the most product? In the middle. The one half mile walk may be too far for some people at each end of the beach, but your cart serves as many people as possible. One day you show up at work just as your cousin Teddy is arriving at the beach with his own ice cream cart. In fact, he's selling exactly the same type of ice cream as you are. You agree that you will split the beach in half. In order to ensure that customers don't have to walk too far, you set up your cart a quarter mile south of the beach center, right in the middle of your territory. Teddy sets up a quarter mile north of the center in the middle of Teddy territory. With this agreement, everyone south of you buys ice cream from you. 
Everyone north of Teddy buys from him, and the 50% of beachgoers in between walk to the closest cart. No one walks more than a quarter of a mile, and both vendors sell to half of the beachgoers. Game theorists consider this a socially optimal solution. It minimizes the maximum number of steps any visitor must take in order to reach an ice cream cart. The next day, when you arrive at work, Teddy has set up his cart in the middle of the beach. You return to your location a quarter mile south of center and get the 25% of customers to the south of you. Teddy still gets all of the customers north in Teddy territory, but now you split the 25% of people in between the two carts. Day three of the ice cream wars, you get to the beach early and set up right in the center of Teddy territory, assuming you'll serve the 75% of beachgoers to your south, leaving your cousin to sell to the 25% of customers to the north. When Teddy arrives, he sets up just south of you, stealing all of the southerly customers and leaving you with a small group of people to the north. Not to be outdone, you move 10 paces south of Teddy to regain your customers. When you take a midday break, Teddy shuffles 10 paces south of you and again steals back all the customers to the far end of the beach. Throughout the course of the day, both of you continue to periodically move south towards the bulk of the ice cream buyers until both of you eventually end up at the center of the beach, back to back, each serving 50% of the ice cream hungry beachgoers. At this point, you and your competitive cousin have reached what game theorists call a Nash equilibrium, the point where neither of you can improve your position by deviating from your current strategy. Your original strategy, where you were each a quarter mile from the middle of the beach, didn't last because it wasn't a Nash equilibrium. Either of you could move your cart towards the other to sell more ice cream. With both of you now in the center of the beach, you can't reposition your cart closer to your furthest customers without making your current customers worse off. However, you no longer have a socially optimal solution since customers at either end of the beach have to walk further than necessary to get a sweet treat. Think about all the fast food chains, clothing boutiques, or mobile phone kiosks at the mall. Customers may be better served by distributing services throughout a community, but this leaves businesses vulnerable to aggressive competition. In the real world, Customers come from more than one direction, and businesses are free to compete with marketing strategies by differentiating their product line and with price cuts. But at the heart of their strategy, companies like to keep their competition as close as possible. Okay, so the final locational model that we'll discuss is August Loesch's Profit Maximization Model. Published in an essay in 1954, the profit maximization model completely disregarded Weber's least cost theory. Loesch argued that while access to raw material and transportation costs are important, the only variable firms use to determine location is profit. When deciding to locate firm or factories, the business will determine the location based on the cost and demand curve where revenues are highest and costs are lowest. The major difference between the two models was Loesch's, uh, emphasized, Loesch emphasized the total production cost as opposed to transportation, labor, and agglomeration costs. You can see an example of this outlined in this graph over here on the right. This zone of profitability is the limit at which a firm will locate before it sees profit loss. And it will base its decision on maximizing the difference between incomes and cost. Now, according to Loesch, quote, the complexity stems from the fact that there is more than one geographical point where the total demand of a surrounding district is at a maximum. The greatest profit attainable at each of these points can be determined from the cost and demand curves. And from this place of greatest money profits, the optimal location can be found. Now, the model has five main assumptions. One, land is an isotropic plane or a two-dimensional flat plane. Two, population is evenly distributed and not clustered. Three, the cost of transportation is transferred to the consumer through product pricing. Four, people are rational consumers. And then five, new factories can easily enter the market as long as they are profitable. Now, like with all models, these assumptions make it difficult to apply to all business locational decisions. However, Loesch makes some valid points. He argued that total consumption is an important variable to consider, which Weber completely left out of his model. When consumption rates are higher, profits will increase. And based on the demand curve, any decrease of price would automatically stimulate the volume of consumption. 
While Weber's least cost theory, Hotelling's locational interdependence theory, and Loesch's profit maximization model all have significant limitations, each of these theories provide compelling explanations for firm locations. Thank you for watching Understanding Human Geography with Professor Lane. Tune in to other episodes covering a range of topics on the history of geographic thought, population and migration, economic development, industrialization, culture, geopolitics, and urban systems.